let me let me recap up to this point young marriage extreme abuse to the point that you're having physical breakdown you and your kids escape with the help of your parents and your um your multiple psychologists are saying hey by the way you you've been abused and you're figuring all of this out and trying to stay safe and trying to decide how to move forward and the church is telling you you really need to come back and stop being so stubborn. Have I summed it up fairly well? Yeah, they, I was even told that paper in your hand, divorce paper means nothing because in the eyes of God, and that will help oh, your kids always. Wow. Okay, so um, now, <laughs> all right, let's, let's move forward here. Um, and because because I want to keep I want to keep people moving with this. Uh, so the union president sits down with you and makes you tell him your story in excruciating, sobbing detail. You're crying. Yeah. You're alone with him, right? Yes, I was alone and with him. He asks you questions. You tell your whole story: the sexual abuse, intimate details, and then. He says, thank you so much for your confidence in me. I'm going to go and make sure you're safe. No. Uh, he just said, let's, I mean, you guys should separate for now. And that oh. was it. And, and then after that, my mom spoke, like months after that, she spoke to the division officials and asked them, like, what's the church's policy on, on um, abuse? And I said, oh, there's zero tolerance. And then she oh. told them my story. And they're like, oh, that's so horrible. Like, that's so, so horrible. It's, there's zero tolerance. But then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. I wrote to them. And then they were like, well, you have, to, you have to talk to them. And then I spoke to, in the meantime, they changed the women's ministry director in the conference. I spoke to her. Mm -hmm. I told them even that there's suspicion about child abuse besides my abuse. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry you went through that. I'm so sorry. Like, it's so horrible. He's like, my, my husband will talk to you, who was then the, the conference president. And then he was not calling me. And after a few days, I asked, like, what's going on? He said, oh, he will call you. Mm -hmm. So then he called me, and then I had to tell my story to him alone all mm -hmm. over again. And when I finished, I mean, it's literally, it's hard already talking about it, especially when you just came out of it. Telling it to men, yeah. it's... It's even more degrading and embarrassing and humiliating. And the whole time he was like, I'm so sorry. You should have spoken up earlier. You know, we didn't do anything because we didn't know. And I'm like, almost a year has passed. How can you right. say you, you didn't know? I told right. your wife. I told the previous women's ministry director. said, well, you should have come to us. You should have come to the conference president. I'm like, how can I come to the conference president when you're a man and you're expecting me to come to you? But in the end, he asked me, okay, now you told me everything. Uh, we're going to call together a grievance committee. And then we're going to have more men come in. And then you have to tell your story again. And I told him, like, why do I need to do it over again when you know it? Your wife knows it. Right. So now you've, you've had to tell this in excruciating detail to two separate men neither of who have, have done anything to protect you or stand up for you. And then he calls a grievance committee of three more men saying that you must start from the beginning and do it a third time. Yes, and I asked for a psychologist to be present and they said they don't need one. They're going to pray and they're not going to go on any side. They're just going to be neutral. And then I asked if at least they can have a woman and then he told me like, okay, you can choose from, because there are three administrators, like the secretary, the president, and the treasurer. They told me, oh, you can choose from one of our wives. Now, one of them uh, told me that there's no rape in marriage, so I can't choose her. There's one of them who doesn't talk to me, didn't even ask if how I'm doing, if I can feed my kids, if we're okay, I'm not gonna choose her. So I went with, the one who was at that point the women's ministry director and the children's ministry director. I mm -hmm. thought maybe she will understand some things. Uh, but in the end, they both ended up, both the president and this woman are on the witness list of my ex against me and my kids. So that's fast forwarding. Wow. But just that committee. Hold on a second. Hold on. So, 
So you've been told by the union president above the conferences that you have to tell him all the details of your abuse history and, and rape and marriage and sexual abuse. And then you're told by the conference president that you must tell him all of these details. And then after that, they say, come in front of this panel of three men who are all- Yeah, I declined. Church I declined. I asked, I will go if I can bring a psychologist. And they said, I right. can't. And they, so and I declined they and wrote the statement. So you cannot have a therapist with you. And then, yeah. they, well, you can choose one of our wives, the three of us, that will be the panel, and you can choose one of our wives. So you choose the women's ministries director. She's there. And then later, much later, you discover that that president and his wife, the women's ministries director, are both on the character witness list for court for your rapist. Yes. yes. Okay. Have you guys followed this so far? little recap, bullet point recap there. So then they've said, okay, I think I, I know that there are so many more details. And you guys, right now, I'm actually going to drop an investigative uh, reporting journal article underneath in the comments that you guys can read. This article has painful, mind-blowing detail, transcripts, recordings, the works of what has gone on in this. So if you want to really get into this and you have the time, you can read this article. There's a whole series of them. Start with the one I just linked in the comments. And so now let's, I want to pause here for just a second because I want to introduce our audience to a couple of terms. I think that very often we have a hard time recognizing abuse. We have a hard time recognizing sexual assault. We have a hard time recognizing domestic violence, not because it doesn't feel wrong, but because we don't have the vocabulary terms to articulate what is going on. And individuals who do have a tender conscience and who want to do what is right, what is right, in other words, people who are not sociopaths, they, we, we want to make ourselves as responsible as possible for our part in any conflict. So that can be exploited if you don't have the terms for what abuse is happening because you will just keep blaming yourself. I must be crazy. I must be wrong. I must not understand. And so we say these things over and over again. Now, I want to introduce you to the term institutional betrayal. This term was coined, to my knowledge, by Dr. Jennifer Freyd of the University of Oregon. She's the founder and president of the Center for Institutional Courage. Institutional betrayal is when institutions harm those who are dependent upon it. This includes churches. This Institutional betrayal includes the failure to prevent or to respond supportively to wrongdoing within the institution where there is a reasonable expectation of protection. When you are a rape victim and you are going to someone in charge, asking them for help, for safety, for understanding, for protection for you and your children, and they fail to stop the harm or at least step in to protect if it is beyond their ability to stop the harm, that is institutional betrayal. And the harm of institutional betrayal is both pragmatic, it's just practical, and it is psychological. What gets worse is when institutions like this, like what has happened to you, when these institutions go a step further and they activate a tactic, an abuse tactic called institutional DARVO. Now, if you haven't heard of DARVO before, it is an acronym and it stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. So it's like, we didn't do that. You're the one who did it. Now I'm the martyr. And that is the abuser's mantra everywhere you go. So 
Institutional DARVO is when a larger organization responsible for protecting the vulnerable employs this tactic. So uh, um, <clears throat> this is a lot, but I want to scoot up right to the last couple of weeks. I know this has been going on for years, but in the last couple of weeks, what's the latest? How has the church responded over the last couple of weeks at the union level on down to the situation with your story? Well, first of all, Before, you spoke out. Sorry? You spoke out. First of all, you spoke out, right? Yeah. Before you go into what's happening now. Okay. Um, back. Just to go back to the evaluation to understand where they come from. Their evaluation stated, and this quote will be, it's carved into my mind, when their evaluation was, um, you have not been, we cannot accept the term rape, but uh, a better word for it would be sexual intercourse without your um, permission, because you were sleeping, so there was no coercion. That's the definition of rape. And then I showed them the dictionary and I was like, that's the definition of rape. And they told me, I don't have the right to question their sanity. They are chosen by God to do his work. So I should work on my spiritual and mental and all the kind of healing and leave it, leave the decisions to those who are chosen by God to do his work. And they gave me all that in writing. You know, from and the, I was sobbing, Sarah. I was sobbing. Uh, I I could uh, not right. understand, like how 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 can you say you were not raped? It was only sex without your consent, which is rape. So with that, with that, they are accepting. Oh yeah, that happened, but it's not that bad. Right. It was your husband, and all of them have daughters, which boils down to he has a right to. Yes. I'm married to you, he has a right to. Oh, and I was even told I should be happy because every normal woman finds it um, impressive if their husband wants them, no matter at what time or how many times or in what form. I was so like, we should no. Be like, it's yes, a compliment. We should be thankful. We should be thankful. No matter when or how, or if it's in the middle of the night, or if it's when you're sleeping, or if it's when you didn't give your permission, we should be thankful. I guess we should be thankful because he comes to us and not to the porn sites or sex chat rooms or, I mean, they put all that included that, oh yeah, he was a porn addict. And we sent him to a three month recovery where he wrote his own reports every week. And we gave him a book, which he read and wrote a report on it. And now he's a changed man. And I have to understand the power of God, how he can transform people. So just going from that to where we are now. Yes, in the meantime, they also asked to disfellowship me. Uh, even the union asked to disfellowship me. And they held my membership for a year. And then out of nowhere, they decided to send the membership here where I am. And right now I'm the member in the local church where I live currently. And then court is taking a very long time now with Corona and with tactics to prolong everything. Uh, we decided to go on national TV right. and we did. And that speed up the process in the sense that right away, court got activated mm -hmm. and the minute they got activated church also got activated like it wasn't enough that all this time they were protecting him collecting money for him uh giving out reports that he suspended but on the other hand uh there was proof that he was actually still working i go on national tv and the next day they issue a union level report that he's been suspended now, just the day after that, CPS does an evaluation on him where he brings proof that he still works for the church. And then I'm like, like, am I the crazy one here or who's crazy because somebody, I mean, there's something's wrong. 
but they make an official statement from the union and from his conference that he's been suspended the minute they found out about the allegations. Mm -hmm. But then the very next day, because you know, it's, it's evaluation is dated and it's mm -hmm. dated to the very next day where they state that he brought in his visa because he gets it from the church through working to the church and he brought it in to show and that he works at the church. He makes that much money. He doesn't pay for rent. He lives in the church building and so on. In other and I'm words, like, okay. The church is sheltering him, protecting him, providing for him and paying him. Yes. Correct. Yes. And me fighting, they're stating as revenge. That it's just my revenge and that I want to cover up my mistakes by just throwing a whole bunch of mud on him. And they don't understand how serious this is, especially because there are children involved. So and the more... minute the court, um, I do not want to go into like details when it comes to the children. There, there was um, abuse, um, pretty serious, very serious actually. I can understand my daughter because I went through, it wasn't as serious as hers, but I went through abuse just to make it clear, not from my parents, from an outsider. And it took me three years to speak up. When you were a little girl, you mean? When I was a little girl. Right. So I totally understand my daughter because they keep saying, how come your daughter didn't say it right away? Mm -hmm. I'm like, if anybody knows child psychologist, child psychology, like she spoke up in play therapy. Mm -hmm. That's what helped her. I was, I could be suspicious, but I cannot say anything until, until there's actually a professional saying it, because then it would be revenge. Then it would be slander. Right. And I couldn't say anything. And that's what they're using against me. Oh, you just made it up. You just made it up for a year later. And the minute the court ordered all of these proceedings, all these evaluations, um, my father got a phone call from the conference president, which is protecting my ex asking him to stop all court cases. What will it take to stop all court cases? And my father said that it's not his, it's my court case. He has nothing to do with it. Besides that he supports me because he wants us protected. Right. And then they asked for, the, for my lawyer's number and they called my lawyers and try to mediate of what will it take to put an end to all of this? What does Anita want? And my lawyers kept saying, Anita wants the truth. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but what would it take? What could it, everybody's suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids are suffering. Anita's suffering. My ex is suffering. The whole church is suffering. This is dividing the church. Like, like, like let's just find something. Let's, let's find, let's compromise. And my lawyers did a budge. They just said, you know, Anita wants the truth. That's all Anita wants. And they even asked this pastor, like, don't you think, they were like, we're not the same religion, but don't you think, we believe in one God. Don't you think the God up there wants us to fight for the truth? He, he always wants to fight for the truth. His answer was, I'm not going to start interpreting what God up there wants from us to do or not to do. And I was like, okay, good thing you're the pastor. And after that didn't work out, my father started getting threatening messages. Mm -hmm. When that didn't work out, they put together a petition asking my father to resign. And they did like a complete revision of all of the finances at the, at the conference. And they didn't find mm -hmm. anything. And they kept Who telling him that, well, the union. The union. The union okay. had to do it. Yes, the union had to do it because they are above them. So they did they checked everything. They couldn't find anything. Uh, the allegations also stated multiple things that I'm making up lies and that I have damaged the church's image because I went on national TV. On national TV, I didn't speak about the church. They asked me, uh, what does he do, my ex? And I said, he's a pastor. And they asked which church. And I said, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that I'm from the same denomination. And then that's where it ended. All the rest was about the case and my lawyer was there and they believed that I have damaged the church completely in the public eye. And because of that, you know, my father, oh, you have another train. I have another train. 
see. <laughs> Let's wait and for it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay, it's We're gone. Good. So yeah, it kind of felt like they keep trying to find something to of course. get him out of the picture. Uh, they even wanted to discipline me for going out because it was a Saturday. That was the only time we got. And since I didn't respect the it's Sabbath, mm -hmm. yes, that I should have been disciplined. And my father brought it. They told him that he's being, um, he's on my side because he's the church pastor where I'm at. And I shouldn't be a member where he's the pastor because like mm -hmm. this, he's like on my side. And my father said, you know, okay. He gave it to the church board and they unanimously, everybody signed that they don't believe I should be disciplined. And like, there you go. Nobody wants to discipline her. But then that now, wasn't enough. In the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, discipline has to be done by the local church. It can't be done by two or three levels high. So that was the proper protocol, actually, for this particular bylaws of this denomination. All right. Yeah. And so they... And then uh, after that... A, uh, a recording surfaced. Apparently, our union president had a pastor's meeting where he just did straight on slander when it comes to my father, when it comes to me, when it comes to my current husband, when it comes to our court case. He just made up allegations, made up, he discussed with other pastors, made up parts of my sexual life, which is just, straight on disgusting for me mm -hmm. uh, even if he would be sharing truthful things it wouldn't be appropriate but making up lies just to make my ex look better and to justify their uh not taking action mm -hmm. is just not okay it's straight on not okay and somebody recorded it because they believed that this is not okay and the recording got out and I got the transcript and it's just really bad. I mean, they went as far as discussing how there's a law that if my ex gets to, um, I'm not sure what is the right word for it, but basically sneak the kids away and take them back to South America, I will never get them back, which I was mortified that they're actually talking about something like that on I'm a pastor's meeting. After my ex already threatened with it. They're advocating the idea of international kidnapping among pastors. They were not advocating. They were just talking about it as a possibility. Discussing. Okay. Discussing, commenting with it. Oh, yeah, there's a law. Maybe that's why she's, like, slandering him. That's why she made up the story, because there's that law. If he gets to sneak them out, she will never get them back. And I'm like... If they're talking about that in a pastor's meeting, that's already a topic. I mean, it doesn't just pop into their mind. And I was right. mortified. I was mortified. And that came out. And my father took action. And he wrote an email just um, explaining a couple of things and saying that he cannot um, accept these kind of lies. And then because of that, they said, oh, you have a conflict of interest. And then they called together the executive uh, conference committee and they voted him out that he cannot be president anymore because of conflict of interest. And then my question, if my father has a conflict of interest for trying to protect his daughter and grandkids, how come there is no conflict of interest for all the administration who are on the list of witnesses for him, because it's not just those two people. It's the union president, the union secretary, the conference president, conference secretary, conference treasurer, and the conference women's ministry director. So then how come they don't have a conflict of interest? How come the conference president, where he is, has no conflict of interest, but he called my lawyers to put an end to all of this? How come the union president has no conflict of interest but he can do slander and talk lies in front of other people and nobody gets touched, but they put out my father for conflict of interest because he spoke up against lies, so but they are still protecting my abuser. Right. And then I ask like, where is the balance? And then I write to the division 
and they tell me, oh, it's a local problem, we can't get involved. Mm -hmm. And then where does one go if like no nobody cares, it's like they stick their head into the sand and nobody cares. They keep saying, I manipulated everything, I made up everything, but they don't have actual proof. They just keep, you know, saying it, trying to discredit, trying to discredit the article that was put out, but they have I no defense. Yeah, they I have no defense besides, oh, she made it up. Okay, prove it, I made it up. Right, right. Like I well, have everything on paper and then, okay, prove it to me. Right. So for those of you who are wondering, and maybe you weren't here with us for the first part uh, of this interview, I just dropped a link with an investigative journalism article that has those transcripts the recordings, the emails, all of that information there. So for those of you who are, uh, the, you, you want to nerd out on the facts, go ahead. I dropped the link underneath. Um, and Anita, what, what happened next with your dad? I don't know. We will find out tomorrow, I think, because tomorrow there is a meeting where they are going to vote on, let's say, the wording. They're just going to write out why he was... He never got a document. He's going to get it, I guess, tomorrow. No, why he was told fired. Us, told us, you haven't told us what happened before that, though. They went on a witch hunt fired. for the whistleblower. Right. They fired her dad. Yeah. Like, I, I know you From his I, position. You said this. They, they removed him as the conference president. For conflict so of interest. For conflict of interest. So it wasn't just that they were scolding him for conflict of interest while they also are character witnesses for her on his side of the court, it, it's that they actually fired him as the conference president in retaliation for his support of his daughter and his grandchildren and his support of truth and facts. And the discussions behind these were leaked. <laughs> 